we we've secularized that but we uh, again have a lack of memory of the the roots out of which that sense of care for the singularity not merely for the singularity but actually for people who from a pragmatic point of view are useless people get old uh, you know children are born with deformities they don't they don't serve any utilitarian purpose in the economy of serviceable disposability and yet they're protected and they're loved and treated as sacred uh, so, but so I, I don't think one can prescriptively say what Christian philosophy would be because uh, philosophers, they come in groups, they come as individuals. And I know that in my case, I was brought up in a Catholic home and that to deny those roots as somehow uh, also roots for possible <coughs> thinking would seem to me to be a mutilation of what I am. I wouldn't be thinking properly uh, if I didn't allow them to challenge uh, the thoughts that I have tried to think. I mean, just think of it analogously. If if you were to say, art is art, philosophy is philosophy, we should not allow the artists and the poets in any way to influence the kinds of thinkings that we do. Think of Heidegger. Heidegger wants a dialogue between the philosopher and the poet. Why not a dialogue between the sacred writer or the sacred figure and and and, and in a, why not in a Christian sense as much as in a pagan sense or in a any other sense. So I think that philosophy ought to embody this porosity to the, the religious and the Christian. But I, I know I'm not, a, I mean, I, it's just that this debate about a Christian philosophy is shaped very much by uh, relation to Thomism and so on in, in early modernity. I, I do think that as, 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 a, as, as a Catholic, there is not just one philosophy that is the essence of uh, the Christian uh, message, <coughs> the gospel itself is a is 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 a is a shocking, surprising, astonishing communication, uh, which should snap us out of our complacency as thinkers. Um, so, um, so in in principle, there. Th it, it seems to me you wouldn't be a genuine thinker if you were not open to these strange, astonishing claims made by Christianity in particular and by other religions in a more general sense. But then philosophy would have to re reinvent itself. It would have to be continually reinventing its, its, its characteristics, pattern, patterns of thinking. Um, and again, that, that's, 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 that's an ongoing uh, challenge. I don't know if that's, that's, that should be enough yeah, for the moment. I, I, you know? I thought of everything um, very much at the beginning of the conversation because I work in ethics, so what do I know, what do I know about Christian philosophy, really? But uh, also, before the other people who have much more interesting things to say come in and, and speak up their, their mind. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about two things. Perhaps the question of Christian philosophy can be looked at either from the perspective of philosophy or from the perspective of theology, which is in fact the way in which I think around the 40s or 50s the question of whether there is a Christian philosophy was posed. Uh, Etienne Gilson, who was mm. quoted this morning as uh, uh, a, a, a potential uh, precursor of uh, William, um, was very much at the heart of that conversation. So in one sense, from the perspective of philosophy, one would say that there isn't such a thing as a Christian philosophy if, in fact, the space is one of porosity between the two, right? Uh, so, for example, in the area of ethics, I'm thinking of thinkers like Max Scheler or Dietrich von Hildebrand, uh, who um, opened up in their own phenomenological gaze to the kind of uh, realm that per se belongs to theology, they say, that is the realm of sanctity. But if you, if you don't really look at what sanctity means as a phenomenon, uh, you are not a true ethicist open to the whole of reality. So in a way, it's not that you need to be a Christian philosopher in order to look in at something like sanctity and the ethical meaning of something like 
sanctity. You just need to be a good philosopher in a phenomenological vein. That is someone who has eyes for the all of reality and not just for it. But then, so from the perspective of philosophy then, I, I think it's more difficult to talk of something like a Christian philosophy. On the other hand, from the perspective of theology, I think the question here goes back to the problem of the relation between, say, grace and nature, right? And so it was posed perhaps by someone like Blondel uh, in the sense that the question becomes, if uh, nature is intrinsically defined by a supernatural uh, molding, then is it really possible to uh, think outside that molding, right? Uh, of course, this is true at a transcendental level, but it's also true at a categorial level, if you want, that is historically, whereby the contribution of Christianity, at least on the scene of Western thinking, cannot simply be bracketed, but it has to be. So uh, perhaps from the perspective of theology, there is such a thing as a plausibility for something like a Christian philosophy. Then the question of how you uh, reconcile the difference in the two points of view is a difficult one if you hold on, after all, to something like an analogy of being, right? So I, I would not want to make a kind of dialectical <laughs> claim here by saying that well, there isn't a Christian philosophy from the perspective of philosophy, but there is one from the perspective of theology, because that would deny, in fact, the very porosity or the very analogy between the two from which the entire conversation begins. So these are my two cents uh, on the question. I, I hope I'm not, I didn't say anything stupid. Uh, <laughs> so. Not at all. Kind of um, flying saucer there. And we don't even know if this is working. Kind of uh, yeah, yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, I, I suppose I, I um, would want to um, just press the question uh, a, a little bit. Um, I guess, yeah, press, press the question and then propose an analogy that, uh, that struck me a couple of years ago and maybe get some reactions uh, to it. The, the, que the question is um, um, whether, uh, whether in fact, uh, and, and I'm, I'm um, I guess, piggybacking on, on uh, something that, that Carl had mentioned in his uh, question earlier today, um, uh, w whether in fact we can simply make, uh, draw an analogy between um, the relationship of uh, philosophy and art um, to the relationship between philosophy and and Christianity, uh, and so the the point of the question is um, is to to actually draw a distinction between religion in general and uh, Christianity specifically. And wh why would why would there be a difficulty? I, I, it seems to me there's much less of a difficulty thinking about the relationship between philosophy and religion, um, especially in the sense of religion being. Uh, 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 a sort of an, a natural openness of reality to the to the divine, um, uh, because insofar as it's a natural openness of reality to the divine, it, it seems uh, much more obviously to belong to philosophy. But but what about um, the you know the specifically uh, theological data the 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 the, the, the uh, th uh, not just faith. But the theological virtue of faith, and 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 with all of the the content, um, that does seem to pose uh, a much more difficult problem. Um, and one one of the one of the uh, 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 ways to put the the, the question is, um, um, it's it's one thing to speak of a kind of an openness to this particular. Um, historical phenomenon, namely the church or the saints, as Hildebrand uh, would ask. It, it's another thing um, um, uh, to speak of not just an openness to these various others, but in, but in fact, what, what, what happens when one has actually 
committed oneself in faith to the Christian church and to Christian revelation. That and that that's a that's and and say you know in a definitive way, uh, uh, can one f- philosophize? And what what would it mean exactly to philosophize in uh, in in, the, in that context? Um, uh, is that um, uh, does one have to artificially? I mean, you're suggesting, and I agree with you that you you can't artificially remove this. Um, uh, but but uh, what what shape that that might take? So I and I and I I, I mean this is I mean the reason that the, the question comes up con- constantly throughout history is that I think it's it's just an intrinsically extremely difficult question. Um, uh, an analogy that that occurred to me a few years back, and I don't th- not that this an analogy actually uh, analogies don't solve problems necessarily, but they might um, uh, introduce a way to think about it. Um, it. It struck me that there might be something analogous uh, between philosophy, the relationship between philosophy and theology on the one hand, and uh, the Catholic understanding of the relationship between the states of life on the other, so that uh, what are the states of life? Uh, on the one hand is, is, is marriage, uh, uh, and the other is, is consecration. Um, and those are radically different. One can't, uh, uh, the, 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 the religious vows are incompatible with uh, a married life. I mean, incompatible literally. Uh, uh, we, we have all sorts of discussions of, of how the spirit of each can be shared by the other. But um, so uh, it, it, uh, um, the analogy would run something like this then, that there's something about the, the commitment in, in theology that it would be like the, uh, the religious vows um, and uh, uh, that's distinct from the uh, religious state of life, which would be sacramental marriage. Um, and sacramental marriage remains analogous to natural marriage. Uh, so, you know, Christian philosophy would be somehow uh, uh, analogous to natural philosophy, um, and, and, and yet uh, uh, it contains a sort of uh, a definitive act of, it's, it's, it's lived out inside of a definitive act of faith. Uh, it, it doesn't require a kind of abstraction from that. Um, so, so do you see the analogy? I mean, so, th- you know, you've got a difference between theology and philosophy, you have a difference between um, religious life and marriage, um, uh, but marriage itself has two different f- forms that are not simply separate from, e- from each other, but, but are, are um, um, they're recognizably uh, marriages, and yet uh, we, can, we can understand um, uh, a, a sacramental marriage as as uh, a marriage of a, of a still a kind of a particular sort that makes sense only in Christianity. Anyway, I, I went on for a while, but I don't know if anybody has any. I'm going to make uh, two points. One is unimportant, and the other uh, is important but obscure. Uh, so. <laughs> Which comes first? Uh, the, yeah. the, the, the one that is clear, so but unimportant. Okay. Um, again, there might be an analytic. The, 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 there might be an analytic philosopher, so clarity will win the day. You know, so at least I'm clear on the first one. They're, they're drinking beer already. Uh, they're yeah. drinking beer already. That's right. Um, the unimportant point is um, to make a contrast between Kant and Hegel in Hegel's favor for once. Kant is the hey, one. Hegel isn't so bad. I know he yeah, isn't so he bad. Yeah, we're, going to, we're going to redeem him. We're going to redeem him here. I mean, we are the we uh, are the two notorious Hegelians who are anti-Hegelians. So uh, here is a kind of confession, a reparation. Right. Uh, I mean, Kant is the most mischievous because Kant stipulates um, what can't go together. So theology and philosophy can't go together, um, such that. Um, Philosophy is going to have its own terrain. Theology will have its own terrain. But of course, like all colonizing procedures, the terrain that's open to theology shrinks uh, to infinitesimal. So Kant suggests, for instance, in Religion of the Boundaries of Reason Alone, um, that the theologian, or he's done it already in the strife of the faculties, that what the the theologian will do uh, when the theologian reads a biblical text, which is a proper preserve of what the theologian should do, which shouldn't actually be doctrine, 
um, that the theologian will get to the historical sense, literal sense of what the Bible says, and of course, Kant will purloin uh, the narrative of, of the Bible in order to give it an allegorical and moral interpretation. Hegel, God bless his soul, uh, <laughs> does no such thing. In other words, that the, uh, the reason why sort of, uh, I think William and I spend so much time with Hegel is that Hegel writes a vast promissory note which he doesn't redeem. That is, he does have the sense that art and religion and different levels of religion uh, and philosophy somehow or other are within the same complicated, imbricating space. And therefore, that's why, that's why art and religion and philosophy are absolute discourses. So there's something incredibly profound <coughs> about that until in the end we're going to have again another colonizing procedure in which philosophy is going to win out. But I do think so that here is a shout out sort of for Hegel in this particular sense that he actually, uh, even if in the end he's going to domesticate uh, Christianity, which is somehow or other on the continuum with other religions and discontinuous with it, another brilliant insight which is not fully redeemed. Um, so I think that I'd like to say that on his behalf. The second point I want to make is the point I really want to make, uh, but I'm not going to. One? This, this is, is the obscure one. one. This is the obscure one. <laughs> okay. The obscure point I want to make is uh, the first part of it isn't quite so obscure, but the second part is. The first part is uh, Jules Song has been mentioned, and obviously he's the most famous person in the 20th century who talked about the Christian philosophy. And of course, he talked about the Christian philosophy. Um, where sort of he thought that the link between philosophy uh, and Christianity is going to be uh, the Exodus experience or the Sinai experience in some sense. Therefore, that we've got, we've got a theophany. And that theophany uh, will allow two different kinds of discourse with respect to it. It does allow, at a limit, a philosophical uh, way of talking about it. And obviously, it's also part of Revelation. The way in which that is redeemable, this is part A of two, uh, is it, that may not be redeemable as such. In other words, that's a very narrow bridge between philosophy and Christianity. It's redeemable, however, of the metaphor of a bridge. Uh, and, that, and the metaphor of bridges. So I think it's redeemable sort of, uh, that that might be one way. Theophany is one way, or um, ontophany is one way in which we have a bridge. But I think it's one of many bridges. That's why I would say it's the metaphor of, or it's, it's a synecdoche, part for the whole of in multiple ways of bridging. So uh, I think William has a very different way, and it's, it's a much more plurivocal way of bridging. Uh, but I do think sort of as a metaphor, it works. That part A was relatively clear. Part B is not quite so clear. I want to say something about Dante. And I want to say something about Dante uh, that related to and is different from uh, what William said. But let's continue with it. So here's what I want to say. It seems to me that you can make, I would want to make the claim, which I'm not going to redeem, um, that Dante is not simply artist, Dante is theologian, and Dante is philosopher. So in other words, rather than saying, what is the bridge, we should ask the question, what's the performance of the bridging, of which I think William gives you a performance of bridging and, multi and gives you multiple performance of different kind of bridges that get built. It seems to me Dante does that too. Under that auspices, uh, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk to the inferno. I want to talk to the paradiso, as giving you a clue to a bridge, but also giving you a clue with respect to another way of talking about metaxu and talking about the intimate universal. So, here goes. I teach a class in eschatology's PhD seminar, um, and what I what I'd like to get my students to think of is okay. I'm not interested in whether there's an afterlife or not. I mean, I am interested, but I don't think it's philosophically, theologically, or artistically interesting. If you're interested in that it exists, the sole reason that you're interested in that it exists is what is it that you're interested in? Mm -hmm. I would want to say that Dante's Paradiso tells you probably as much about what 
uh, Desmond is talking about as all three of us today and all of us today. Think about what, what is the intimate universal. I, I use the word community, I use the word, and communitas or the came up. The intimate universal is a community. A community of what? What does it do? The way in which Desmond's text work for the most part, and I think he performed it this evening sort of as well, is we're always doing an archaeological dig of the belonging and community from which we have fallen, and one element of that fallenness uh, is our reflection, other element of the, of, of the fall, of course, sort of is our libido dominante. So we, we've got an existential deformation and we've got a reflective def deformation. But the other way of looking at archaeology is to look at it from an eschatological perspective, to look at it in terms of the projection that we might want to make. So here, if I, if I had to reduce um, the Paradiso to a set sort of attributes regarding the community, uh, I think it would begin to look like uh, what sort of is being uh, indicated by Desmond archaeologically. So what would, what would a heavenly community, which I presume sort of is the culmination of our desire, look like? Well, it would be embodied. It would be enfleshed, but enfleshment now is indicating relationship and intimacy. It would intensify that intimacy. It would absolutely universalize that intimacy in our actual life. Our intimacies are narrow. Uh, we, can't, we can't live a universal life in intimacy. We live intimacy at the expense of its universalization. To have intense relationship is not to have extensive relationship and vice versa. So the heavenly state that we desire presumably sort of is that that's not a zero-sum game. The heavenly state, the communio that we might have, the communio self from which we have fallen, we can look at sort of in the eschatological lens as, well, there's ways in which sort of all relationships are repaired. There's ways in which, too, another, another contrariety of, in our lives, our individuation is usually at the expense of our community. We have to rebel sort of against our belonging. We have to rebel against all these relationships which provide us with debt in order to get individuated. Presumably, again, what that original, original portraiture that William is doing is given sort of in Dante in terms of, again, we do not have that sort of as a zero-sum game. These are kind of some indications of the way that an eschatological lens uh, informs us probably just as clearly, sometimes even more clearly, of what the archaeology is. So I'd want to suggest to William that, um, well, Dante, he already knows the Dantes have helped because he's a Jew Dante on his behalf, so he doesn't need me to tell him that. What I would want to say, though, is that if Dante works in that way to bring out um, these givens, right, this gift, then it would seem to me that one thing we could say about William's, all of William's work then, uh, all reflection on the intimate universal and metaxology, that in a way, sort of, he's always, he has always been telling us, he's always, he's always been leading us towards sort of uh, eschatology. That is, everything that he does archaeologically is simply the reverse of the eschatology he's always been providing us. Beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I've said this to, to Cyril uh, when there was a conference in Leuven, but um, I'm, I'm retired in Leuven, but one of my projects is to write a trilogy which mimics the Divine Comedy of Dante, a book on what I call Desecrations, which is hell, a book on purgatory, which I call Purgations, and a book on heaven, I suppose, which is called consecrations. So mm -hmm. desecrations, purgations, consecrations. But I was teaching the, a, a course on radical evil here last year, and I decided, I mean, I've written lots on evil, in fact. I decided to put aside uh, the desecrations for the moment. Um, but I have written on consecrations also. So in fact, I'm probably at least, ha I have a little bit of me still <coughs> already in heaven, I hope, you know, <laughs> don't have to wait. <laughs> Um, but the, the th one of the things that has worried me about the eschatological, and this, this is, has to be parsed, 
I always worried about Hegel's coming back to the great Hegel. The 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 the, the dynamic of his thinking is so teleologically oriented that it tilts to the end in such a manner that it doesn't do justice to the richness of the beginning. So in my own thinking, to do justice to the between, I perhaps have <coughs> too much stressed uh, origins as opposed to ends, but what, what, what Cyril is saying, and it's actually a very, I think, uh, both Aristotelian and a very medieval insight that the, the final cause is actually the cause of efficience, mm -hmm. that you can't separate the end and the beginning. And it's only because you have a beginning of a certain sort that you can have an end. So the fullness in the end, it seems to me, actually mm. could not be had at all if there was not, in some mirroring sense, a fullness already given at the beginning. A, a lot of teleology, I think, Hegel and afterwards, the fullness will be in the end, but the, the now and the beginning are seen as deficient until we get into the end. And then you get a kind of impatience with life as it now is, because it's always going to be deficient until you get to the end. But if you have this, 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 this surplus agapaic sense of the origin, the relation between the beginning and the end and the middle itself are going to be quite different. Is it, isn't um, that also what you mean when you talk about posthumous mindfulness? Right, this in the, a way. You know, the, 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 uh, the, you know, the, you know, this it's the, posthumous yeah, right, in a right, way. Right, it's yeah. it's it's you're, in the right, 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 That's right. That's right. That's right. This, this, this that's is right. a thought experiment to imagine yourself as dead, mm -hmm. and then you come back. And yeah, what yeah, are the things in life now that you would value, without which life would be bereft of? A, so it's it's a step outside life and death as normally conceived, but not to escape life, but to enter into a kind of mindfulness of what is rich about life as we know experience it. Um, it's, uh, I, you know, the, the philosophers have attacked the, what they call the God's eye view. And the, the, their view of the God's eye view is a kind of total detached spectatorial view. Yeah. But this kind of posthumous mind is precisely intended to, to, to waken us up yeah. to what we love now. And the de deprivation of which would deprive life now also of its deepest meaning. But sometimes we have to step outside life and death as normally experienced to ask if there's a sense of life beyond life and death as we normally experience it. But is, isn't that, in another way, isn't that the divine comedy? That's the divine comedy, yes. Now right. that, because the, because that, you know, the purpose that, of the divine comedy is not uh, the Gnostic speculation about the afterlife. You have someone who's not dead functioning posthumously. Yeah. And, and the purpose of it is to show sort of what is not being done, to show sort of uh, one's culpable ignorance or one's culpable faults, and to, say, to give some indication as to how you might deepen the journey of which, in this instance, you're yeah. only halfway and you're given the second chance. Right. So, I mean, it's interesting, though, the whole question of immortality has been present in the philosophical tradition since Plato, let's say, or even before. Uh, in the intimate universal, when I do talk about the erotics, I talk about begetting on the beautiful and different forms of immortalizing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the immortalizing that takes place through, they say, procreation, the immortalizing of uh, great deeds or poetic works and so on. I do think, actually, that traditional question of, a, of, of, of the beyond beyond life and death as we experience it here is also, uh, 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 you know, you, I don't think we can escape it from the point of view of the erotics of our, no. our being. You know, it's, it's not just that we're projecting into a future beyond, but there is, there, is, there is an energy of affirmation in our being at all, which outlives the boundaries of mm -hmm. finite determination. And it's out of that often that this, this, this desire, this perplexity, this mysterious sense that there's something still more. We can't exactly say what it is, but I mean that perhaps the difficulty in earlier epochs is that they try to imagine it so determinately that it become, became a kind of fixation. But Dante is a brilliant artist in imagining the beyond in that sense, but in a manner that is totally continuous with the, the life here and now. But I think that modern philosophers have given up on that, 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 that there's a dynamic in our very being, in our desire. It's more in our being. Our desire reflects this dynamic in our being, which will not simply stop at the boundary of finitude. 
so much so that we, we, we consider ourselves absurd. You know, the absurdist philosophy of the existentialist can be seen in exactly, but they say we can't stop at the boundary, that's why we're absurd. There's nothing beyond it's absurd. And they, they try to introduce a therapy which stops us there and boomerang us back into constructing our meaning here and now. I think that's, that's whistling in the dark. I mean, if the totality is dark in the way they describe it, we're, our constructions of meaning are no different to that uh, absurd meaninglessness of the whole. So that, that boundary uh, is, is, is a more mysterious boundary. And the, the fact that we won't stop at that boundary is, 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 is part of, so to say, the metaphysical, ontological datum, uh, if I could use a phrase like mm -hmm. that, which has to be reflected on. Um, we may not be able to give the answer, but we should at least have the kind of existential and indeed perhaps religious courage to ask the question, to dwell on that boundary and not pretend, oh yes, I'm going to die, that's it. I mean, I see this in Europe all the time. Oh, I, I, I was brought up a Catholic, but now I'm an atheist and I'm, I'm ready to just become, you know, uh, food for the worms. And I, I, I'm making a joke, I know, but it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a black joke because that sense of the meaninglessness of death actually re a, a boom, a re a rebounds back on a, a deep hollowing out, actually, of the joy of living itself. Yeah. Um, I, so, sorry. So it's one, <laughs> yeah, yeah. One, and, uh, uh, no, I think, I mean, with a thinker that this great kind of sympathy between uh, you and you and Gabriel Marcel, Mar Marcel, this right, question Marcel is, is very good. It's not, this, yeah. it's not just about my own afterlife. It ultimately no, for him no, is, no. Mm -hmm. is the is that, that your beloved. That you say you're there's something about your you being are, that is so good that yeah. it couldn't end. You and are, it's a delight you, in the life hope, of the other, right. not only of my own. Right, life. not only my own. No. You love someone in such a way that, that you would that that person is deathless mm -hmm. or beyond death in some way or other. But we want we don't want to give them up to death. But of course, then you could say, look, I mean, Bertrand Russell made the argument. That's just you know, like if you want your own immortality, that's just a higher form of egoism. But that, that's, that's really a specious argument. You know, if, if, the, if the being of the other is to be loved deathlessly, there's no reason why my being, in some sense, ought not to be loved deathlessly also. I mean, we have great difficulty properly loving ourselves. That, that to me, is also part of the agapeics of being. We ought to give ourselves a proper break in relation <laughs> to the good that we actually are. I know we're jerks, but that's <laughs> I not the whole it. story. <laughs> I can leave. May, no, not you. I know you're you're all <laughs> you're all glorious creatures of the coming kingdom. I see it eschatologically. No. <laughs> Another beer or two, and uh, <laughs> no more archaeology. You know. Yeah. Uh, do we have questions from uh, our attendees? For uh, yes, Carl in the back. Um, this is a question. Sort of There's an analogical understanding of science, there is, obviously, right. because <laughs> right. you know, Thomas Aquinas clearly talks of 
theology as scientia sacra, uh, clearly metaphysics as a scientia, but the scientia of Thomas Aquinas is clearly not the scientia of, say, uh, Wolf. No, mm-hmm. or, or the, the Hegel either, yeah. Metaphysica specialis, of the Metaphysica generalis, yeah. of later neo-scholastic. So, I, I suppose we have to yeah. start with that. But I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I could give you a lecture also on the different functions of metaphysics yeah. in Aristotle's uh, metaphysics and how it works out through the tradition and so on. But I think that there is something about philosophy that you can't, in the end, exhaust. I mean, these are tasks that allow us to formalize a process of uh, investigation or knowledge, even. And they can even be formalized in an academic context, as with the kind of Wolfian rationalism in 18th century <coughs> Germany and so on. But I, I think that there's a deep uh, underlying tension between that institutional formalization of metaphysics qua science, whether modern or pre-modern, and the metaphysical impulse itself mm. as embodied in a kind of, like, like I, I do talk about metaphysical <coughs> mindfulness, and that is not something that can be fully institutionalized. There's something, if you like, uh, gypsy about it. It comes and it goes. And it's undoubtedly clear to me that there are some individuals who seem to be more marked with a kind of um, an, an openness on that particular score. You know, in the, in the Romantic generation, I mean, Schelling talks about uh, the philosopher as a bit like the artist and having intuition and so on. And not, and not necessarily going that direction, but there are people with different gifts. And uh, there's a certain analogy between thinking and the poet on that particular score. Um, so, in strange way, I'm, I, I denounced uh, Heidegger's denunciation of Christian philosophy earlier, but he's not at all wrong in talking about what he called Denken in the later mm. writing. It's a, he's worked his way out of transcendental systematicity, so to say, uh, rather late in his life, actually. I mean, I, I've said this somewhere in print, that intimacy between, say, the poetic and the philosophical is something that was certainly with me from the beginning, just as the intimacy with the religious was also right from the beginning. Heidegger comes to that very, very late. But he's getting at something about the vocation of thinking. It, it is a vocation, it seems to me, in fact. And that vocational aspect can sometimes coexist with the desire to formalize it in a more, if you like, neutral, neutrally generalizable way in an academy or within the studies of, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> theological studies of a church and so on. And we should, we should not forget this, that the, the if philosophy sometimes, it seems to be dead and then a, a, a thinker or two, they emerge and suddenly it's, 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 it's new it's and it's old at the same time. It's, um, but that element of the surprise of a, a reopening of mindfulness the gift as a gift <coughs> dimension, I think, it seems to me, in, in the most creative, say, periods of philosophical thought. May, may I just add a, 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 a little question, I suppose? But um, it, it seems to me um, we, we don't want uh, to, and I'm not suggesting that you're doing this, but, uh, but one might easily interpret what you said there as, as doing this as um, uh, opposing uh, science on the one hand and and sort of mindfulness on the other, no, 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 and no, and no, it, no. it seems to me it's 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 very important in dealing with that question that we don't concede um, uh, an impoverished notion of science yeah. and then Absolutely. react to right. it. Right. And right. 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 I mean, so, so I mean, I well, just <coughs> one one dimension of that is to to recognize that. Um, I, I think that we would want to say there's, there's something absolutely indispensable about the idea of thinking in the light of first principles. Um, but the, the, the basic question you want to ask is, uh, 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 you know, how do we come to, what, what exactly is the relationship between the mind and its first principles? And, and the, uh, a, an impoverished sense of that has, has the first principles as, as kind of a, a um, autonomous uh, power, you know, so, so that, that to mm-hmm. think in life first principles is, is a way of, of dominating and exhausting, uh, right. uh, so, so that, that, you know, here the, the Kantian a priori would be a kind of a, a, a paradigm of that. But, but another way of, uh, 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 of thinking about first principles is something, I mean, if you think of first principles as ontological uh, right. rather than merely yes. epistemological, mm-hmm. you recognize that even our our, our fundamental, the, the, the light in which we think is a light that 
we are entering into and it's not somehow beaming forth from our and uh, for, you know and, and and if that if that's if that's how we begin to think of um, uh, science is thinking in in, in, uh, in the light of first principles but these first principles are something that we're encountering there, there's no need at all to oppose uh, an astonishment at the mystery of things and scientific thinking like, and, I, and I think we we far too often set those in opposition to each other and the consequences are really let me uh, just just, just one small thing there I mean Paul mentioned it today that he, the phrase between system and poetics hmm. there was a hmm. book of collected essays about my work about 10 years ago but I wrote an essay for it called between system and poetics on the practices of philosophy and the title of the book was taken from that and it's a defense of being systematic so yeah. I think systematic thinking is required for philosophy you think one thing you're drawn to what is implicated by that one thing and so on in a network of interrelations. But there's something also trans-systematic, trans-systematic in the sense of what's before system and what exceeds system. Whereas someone like Hegel, the beginning and the end actually become the system. So I think the distinction between being systematic in your thought and claiming to have the system is a different orientation uh, present in both and a different relation to the poetic where poetic here is not the opposite of the sacred either and the intimacy with the religious. Whereas I think Heidegger moves towards the poetic and rejects the yeah. systematic. I think there are a number of people looking to get in. Oh, yes, okay, great. Yeah. If I can actually ask a question on the tail of that in this discussion, because I was thinking, William, uh, in the book you talk about religion, art, you touch on politics in a way. Uh, science is missing, uh, and <coughs> it's a great point to say we don't want to cede to science this impoverished notion science because we see so much of that in what troubles us today. Yeah. So isn't there an intimate universal a connection to wonder and all science of love that, that can be found in the sciences or do you think yeah. that science cannot connect uh, the sense but of the I, I mean, I, I must say that I'm a bit pessimistic yeah, about science, not per se. Mm -hmm. I think that the kind of uh, intentionality of science, if I could p speak that way, is to be open to the real as it presents itself. So it's entirely in the spirit of a kind of agapeic openness mm -hmm. and astonishment. But uh, astonishment can get contracted into a curiosity that is just interested in determinate processes. Mm -hmm. And then the movement is from the initial so-called astonishment to the dispelling of the astonishment in the, some determinist answers. Now, I don't think that that is the truth of the scientific enterprise, <coughs> but when science and technology in the modern sense are so intimately wedded to each other, the, the, the search for the astonishing determinate intricacy of the intelligibility of things, in the end, actually, it's, 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 it's subordinated to our determination of what, in fact, serves useful purposes in, again, in terms of these extraordinary technologies that we have invented. So in, 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 the, in the modern invention of science, science has, has made a, a marriage with a form, forms of technology that are themselves infected by uh, uh, the danger of a loss of true ontological astonishment. I mean, I would agree with that, but do you think it's attitudinal that something that can be overcome? No, I, I actually think it's systematic, no. I think yeah. it's systematic, because, you know, when, when I look at so much of the so-called uh, advances in science are inseparable from the investigation into uh, weapons. War has been a huge impetus to investigate various things. And also it's connected with health and coming back to that. Now again, again that's an absolutely noble uh, aim to alleviate suffering and so on. But in many respects it's driven by the pharmaceutical company's desire yeah. to make profits. So research and investigations are not determined by a certain ethos of ethical concern for the neighbor. They're, they're, they, 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 they fall into the dominion of serviceable disposability. I know it's all ambiguous. There. These things are always mixed. But I, 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 I at times feel that the, 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 whole, the, the, the globalized Western structure of things is uh, there's, there's, a, there's a seed of that kind of corruption at work in it. It's, it's an ontological corruption, which, which sometimes yields great benefits, strangely enough. Uh, evil brings forth good. So I, 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 I must say that I'm, I, 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 I just can't say science, technology, it's great, but then we use it in a bad way. It, uh, that seems to me too, too simple. 
time for one more question. Mark, yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to make kind of a proposal and sort of an analogy to Cyril. I'll, I'll start with what may be kind of a stupidly obvious thing, uh, or at least simple, simplistic, uh, which is that there, there can only be Christian philosophy if Christianity is the truth. Yes. Um, and it's not that there <laughs> Um, and so, so if it is, so here's a proposal, and you can you know, maybe tell me uh, why it's not enough or, or inadequate. But, um, but the proposal then would be that there's part of part of the difficulty that people have always had talking about Christian philosophy, uh, certainly in, in later centuries, is that there's this disquieting relationship between good philosophy and orthodoxy. Christianity has to have um, and and that's that's really crucial, but it's very complicated in church and play. So I, as a Catholic, of course, you know, can recognize Augustine and Aquinas as Christian philosophers. I can even recognize Pascal as a Christian philosopher, though I think his, you know, I think Jansen is a bad philosopher. I can recognize Kierkegaard as a Christian philosopher, even though I think Lutheranism has you know, <laughs> got problems. Uh, and, Very cherishable. But, but then there are, you know, in, in some sense, you know, is, is, I can't really recognize Gnostics as Christian philosophers mm -hmm. because they're wrong about being Christian. Yeah, right. But they're also not independent of Christianity in a way. Like, so, oh, that's right. so you get the question, like, well, is Nietzsche a Christian philosopher? That's strange. Yeah, there's no Nietzsche, it's not Christianity. Yeah. Right. Um, so that, that, that relationship seems to be part of the difficulty. But, but one of the things, again, going back to, well, if Christianity is the truth, then you can only think adequately, which is what philosophy in the ambit of Christianity. And ultimately, isn't that really what orthodoxy is? Right? Orthodoxy is not you know, a set of you know, kind of prescriptive decisions, right? but it's, it's a measure of orthodoxy, a measure of adequacy, right? or adequacy is a measure of orthodoxy. So, so in some sense, they, they have to be one and same, but in another sense, Uh, may I just, uh, sure. uh, uh, F Ferdinand Ulrich is, is fascinating on, on precisely that. Uh, he's been mentioned a couple of times, but, but he, he makes the claim that, in fact, um, for reasons very similar to what you just said, uh, uh, it's, it's only possible today to philosophize in a natural way <coughs> uh, in the faith, and that, that, in fact, every philosopher outside, the, uh, so Nietzsche, for instance, um, uh, is incapable of philosophizing in a pure way. Why? Because uh, that philosophizing will, will necessarily, given uh, the historical condition, will necessarily build theologumina, you might say, into philosophical thinking. And so, so uh, uh, every, everything outside of Christian philosophy becomes uh, a theologizing Philosophy and therefore, uh, um, in a way, betrays the the the, the, the proper philosophical uh, aspiration. Um, I mean, that's a, I think it's a it's a very provocative way of of, of putting uh, or dr maybe drawing out a bit further the point that you were making. Take a closing thought, William. And then well, when you were talking there, I was thinking of Michel Henri who has a little book, I think the title of it is I Am the Truth, or I Am the Way, the Truth. I forget the proper title. But anyway, he takes up that claim of uh, Christ. I Am the Way, the Truth, and the Life. And it's a fascinating book because he goes to work philosophically on those claims. And it turns into a kind of, I, I forget, like a transcendental phenomenology. I'm not quite sure. That, that might be the exact description of the... But in other words, he kind of textually moves and moves and makes this move and that move and suddenly you're in the transcendental sphere and so on. 
uh, where life, of course, uh, the, the affirmation of life is so central in what he's doing. And I just cite this as an example where, uh, in, uh, where perhaps one doesn't say Christianity is true, but if you were to take, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, then you're dealing with a, a, a person uh, and your perplexity, uh, your astonishment, your curiosity, all those things come into play in relation to the, the figure of Jesus. And to think through that, you do have to find some intellectual resources. If, that's, if your vocation is to try and think about that, um, you already presuppose in some way uh, the, the, the building up of some intellectual resources that throw some light on this, 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 this radically recalcitrant mystery. You know, the mystery is there as the truth, but we as finite mortals try to understand it. Um, so y that, that open space between the thinker and the truth has to be inhabited by a kind of truthfulness or being truthful, which, which I think can be formulated then in a, in, in a plur plur plurality of ways. Or there can be a plurivocity to our being truthful, which in no sense denies the, the truth. But again, it's a very platonic response in one sense, the gap between us as philosophers seeking to know the truth, but in this instance, the Christ as the truth, uh, and yet our practice as philosophers as, as not giving up in the search for what the truth uh, betokens. Uh, now that, that, that's, that seems to me to be, I couldn't see any objection to that as a Christian philosophy. Uh, and in fact, I think that philosophers, to the extent that they, look, when you look at the, just historically, the. The, 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 not only the claims made by Christianity, but the huge historical significance. If, you, if, you, if you're an atheist or a humanist, you just have to acknowledge that the world has been reshaped by, 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 by not but merely by Christianity, but by the response to Christ. And um, in, in intellectual honesty and integrity, not to somehow think about that strikes me as a kind of sin against the light. And if we philosophers can't make some honest acknowledgement of that, then we're in, we're in bad shape. But we're in good shape. <laughs> 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 we're letting, hopefully that is what we've been up to uh, today. And we can continue down the hall once again uh, over a pint or a glass or what have you. Uh, but thank you to all our panelists and to William.